Hello again, vinyl community. Well, if you've watched my last couple of videos, you know what this one's going to be all about. I, I explained, I received a request from Mr., I believe it was Juan Marte. I, I apologize if I have your name wrong, Mr. Marte, but he asked about doing a follow-up with a 90s, Beatles in the 90s video. So I just did a real quickie uh, Beatles in the 70s video to show some of the legit releases that came out in the 70s. Uh, so now I thought I'd do one for the 90s. Okay, to complete my little run here of Beatles in the different decades. Okay, so going back a little bit to the 80s one, as I explained. The 80s, I felt was a little bit difficult in the beginning. I thought with the release of Rarities in early 1980, and with the release of 20 Greatest Hits and Real Music in 1982, I thought that capital EMI, whatever you want to call them, um, I thought they were a little bit weak when it came to Beatles releases. And then as I said in the 80s video, everything shifted at the end of the 80s. Whenever they started coming out with the new compact disc digital medium and the Beatles finally got the digital release treatment with their first run of CDs back in 1987 coming into 1988, it really changed the way we Americans listen to the Beatles forever. Uh, we were, as I said in that video, we were so used to the American releases for 20 plus years. That's what we grew up on, that's what we knew and loved. And then finally, everything came up together in the entire world as far as what was known as the official Beatles releases would be the original UK releases when they came out in CD in the late 80s. Um, then we come into the 1990s and um, things started to get much better leading up to today where we've gotten some fantastic Beatles releases but back in the 90s the first legitimate release several years after the first initial CDs came out finally finally unreleased material the Beatles were finally releasing some unreleased material and they did it in the form of this album right here the Beatles live at the BBC which originally came out on compact disc and cassette and um, boy, this was a huge release for people like me, folks. I, I don't know how else to explain it. To get material like this, to get unreleased, and I have the uh, little EP that came out around the same time uh, tucked in the back here, which I will, uh, well, I don't want to really take it all out part right now. But anyway, when this came out, it was just so exciting because we were getting unreleased stuff. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, let me mention that uh, because someone might say to me, oh, you could get this stuff for years. I understand that. I myself, back in the mid-80s, went to a Beatles convention and I was able to get a double CD by the Swinging Pig label called Live at the BBC or something like that, or Beatles, Beatles at the BBC. Uh, and it was a double disc and it had most of the material on here was on that disc. So I had heard this material years earlier, I had had copies of it, um, albeit probably not in the, as good as quality as the official release, but it was still pretty darn good quality. So in the interest of full disclosure, let's face it, many of us real fanatics had this material. We heard it before on bootlegs or fan club only releases, but I'm talking from the average fan's perspective. In 1994, okay, Live at the BBC came out November 30th, 1994, it did pretty good pretty good on the charts, uh, actually did pretty well, it went, made number three, which is darn good. So it made number three on the album charts, um, again a lot of great material on here, songs the Beatles recorded exclusively for the BBC that you could not get anywhere else. Uh, as I said, this nice little mono um, EP came out with the single Baby It's You, I'll Follow the Sun, Devil in Her Heart, and Boys, those three were not available on this album so they were extra bonus songs you could get on this little disc right here. But boy folks, this was the first big Beatles release in the 90s and what a way to start the decade with some unreleased material that had never been officially released before by the Beatles. Okay? So, that comes and goes and what do we know? Just about a year later we get the big news and let's face it, it was huge news for us folks that the Beatles anthology was being produced and created, which was going to be a multifaceted major release from the Beatles. It was going to, this is what we were told, it was going to include video, it was going to include a TV special, it was going to include, um, a, a book was going to be coming out with it. 
that there were going to be three separate albums, all of unreleased in the vaults Beatles material. We also got word that the uh, three surviving Beatles were working on new material, that they may be recording some new songs together for these releases. I, I don't even think I need to explain to you if you were around back in 19, early 1995 and you knew about the excitement of the Beatles recording a new song together or new music together and about these releases coming out and the video and the book and it, there was going to be so much attached to it and so much promotion was going on. Uh, I, I don't know how to explain to you those of you that weren't not around but for me this was probably the closest I felt to being around in the 60s when the Beatles were coming out with a brand new release or the Beatles were doing something new and exciting and what those older fans must have felt in the 60s. I was a little young. I'm an original first generation fan, but I was a little young in the 60s. So although I do remember things being released and coming out, I don't have that excitement that those the people a little bit older than me had. But this is probably the closest I came to that back in the 90s when, when it was announced that the anthology was coming out. The first album, uh, I'm not sure when the special came out. I'm, I'm trying to think of the time frame. I think it was all about the same time, so I don't have dates as far as when the special. But when that ABC TV special came out over a couple of nights and Free as a Bird and Real Love were going to be exclusively premiered, uh, boy, it, those of you that were there, you know what I'm talking about, that excitement, that... Uh, I hate to keep using the word excitement, but I don't know what else to say. It was just so monumental and so thrilling to just experience this new Beatles official release in so many different formats. Um, I don't know how else to explain it to you. It was, it was just fabulous. It was just a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's, it's something that will probably never happen again with the excitement level of this. Um, although we did have Sgt. Pepper recently remixed by Giles Martin and that was exciting and a big deal and, and we all also had the Hollywood Bowl and uh, the eight days a week film with Ron Howard. All great things folks, all wonderful things that have happened in the last 10 or 15 years. But for me folks, uh, going since the Beatles actually broke up in 1970, I don't think anything has been as, as fun as, as a happier moment in the Beatles history than when the anthology was announced and was released in all the different formats. So this first one, Anthology 1, I remember, oh god, I went into a, a major city near where I live because at midnight this was going to be coming out. Uh, I got it on cassette originally, this the vinyl I got much later, but I went to a store at midnight in the middle of a city near where I live to get this anthology one and when I got I think it was a Tower Records which unfortunately Tower they're pretty much all gone now but I stood in line with hundreds of other people and I'm not kidding folks hundreds of people in line waiting went outside the store down the block around the corner waiting to get this release that's how big this was with that TV special with the Beatles re-recording new music recording new music together um, it, it, you can't even imagine what what an exciting time it was, what a fun time it was, and I'm so pleased to have been part of that. So, November 21st, 1995, I was in line with hundreds of other people when this album, Anthology One, was released. Okay, I'll show you the back here with the beautiful cover done by um, Mr. Klaus Varman himself did the cover and. Don't think I need to tell you folks, this went to number one, number one album. It sold well, did great. Um, the Free as a Bird single or song came out on the TV special, was premiered on the TV special that first night at the end of the first episode. And uh, I believe it made number six on the charts. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but not too shabby. Number six, top ten, Free as a Bird uh, song. Uh, recorded by Paul, George, and Ringo using John's uh, backing track from the late 70s that John had recorded and Yoko gave to Paul. Uh, you know the history. And uh, boy, I can't explain what a fun album this was to me. This, this has so, many, so much special meaning to me and I'm sure to many of you. So again, the second big Beatles release in the 90s was Anthology 1, which came out on November 21st, 1995.
okay. Then we go several months later and they told us, okay, now finally Anthology 2 is coming out. This was released on March 18, 1996. Shot to number one on the charts. Again, um, some people had some minor complaints with this uh, because this is when some of the tracks started to get into a little gray area of you know, what's legitimate, unreleased, uh, in the vault stuff and what has been tinkered with. Um, you know, some people felt that maybe some of the tracks had been Frankensteined uh, by George Martin and some of the people at, at you know, EMI uh, or Powerphone, whatever. And so there were some gripes by the real hardcore audiophiles about some of the legitimacy of some of these tracks on here and where they tinkered with a little bit, especially when you get into the, the Sgt. Pepper era. Um, there was, you know, some talk of that. I don't know too much about that. I'm just going by an average fan that I was, and basically that I was just so happy to get this number two, uh, Anthology 2. I just thought it was great. I loved it, still love it, and um, some of the tracks on here just, just blew me away with some of the things I was hearing for the first time ever. So, next release in the 90s, Anthology 2, March 18th, 1996, number one album. And of course, as you know, Anthology 3 came out. And that was on October 28th, 1996. Uh, this one also made number one on the charts. So again, if I'm wrong, maybe in some other countries it didn't, but from my research, looking into the United States charts, all three made number one. So what an accomplishment for the Beatles. What something to be proud of. Uh, another uh, notch to add into their legacy of three number one albums like this in a row. Uh, so Anthology 3 comes out October of 96, goes to number one, and uh, again the final completion of the Klaus Vormann painting on the cover here. Again the back, look like the back of a painting with the song titles. And um, the only thing a little sad about Anthology 3 for me is I heard the Beatles were working on a final, uh, George Paul, Paul and Ringo were working on a third track uh, I think it was called Now and Then, uh, a third John Lennon song, and uh, but they, for some reason, either George got frustrated with it or somebody did and they didn't, decided not to finish it. That's the only downer for me about the whole anthology thing is that, you know, you had the little cherries, like Paul said, we put a little cherries on top of the uh, anthology releases and he, and he sure was right. You had anthology one, had Free as a Bird on it. Anthology 2 had real love on it, which in some instances I, I think is even a little better than Free as a Bird. I love it so much. So real love is on Anthology 2, but there really wasn't that special cherry on top, so to speak, on Anthology 3, unfortunately, which I think would have just capped the whole thing off nice if the George, Paul, and Ringo had just finished one more John song, maybe that Now and Then song, and placed it on here. I just think it would have made it just totally... Uh, complete and, and, and capped everything off beautifully. But they didn't, they didn't do it. Um, I know Paul jokes sometimes that maybe someday he's gonna nick the song and uh, finish it up himself and, and put it out there as the Beatles, but I don't know if he's just you know busting chops or if he's really thinking of doing that, but it would have been nice to have it back in the day when this all came out. So we didn't get it, but that's okay. And um, it's a great album. I love it. Again, there's the, some of the critics who say there's some Frankensteining done on here. Uh, but boy, uh, the material here just blew me away. I love it. I'm just so happy to have it. And uh, I'll always cherish the Anthology series for what it was. And um, as a matter of fact, I, I neglected to mention, I think I mentioned it in one of my other videos, but I, Anthology 1, I had a chance to see the Pete Best Band in concert several years ago, which was a great show, by the way. Pete Best, uh, he put out a great album at the time. And uh, I saw Pete at, a, at the show and he signed Anthology One for me, Pete Best. Uh, Pete plays on 10 tracks on this album. I'm so happy for Pete. It was the first legitimate official Beatles release where Pete Best gets credit and he's on some of the songs. So God bless Pete. He finally got his due and he finally made some well deserve money on the sales of this album. I think he made money in the millions because of the sales of this album that he's on a lot of the songs. So happy for Pete Best. Okay, so the final Beatles release in the 90s was 
the Yellow Submarine song track, which was a total remixing of all the songs that were in the Yellow Submarine film. Even if a snippet of a song was in that film, like Think For Yourself, it was only a brief couple of seconds snippet of that song in the Yellow Submarine uh, film, but it's on here in its entirety and it's been remixed. Okay, the Yellow Submarine song track came out in September 13th, 1999. And believe it or not, it made number 15 on the charts here in America. Number 15. And a lot of people love this album, folks. They really, I, I do, I count me as one of them. I really think this was a great album. Uh, as you can see, I do not have the vinyl yet. Someday I will achieve it <laughs> and be able to find it and afford it and get it. But uh, I do have the CD to show you some of the inner pictures of the CD here. All right. There you go. Okay. The Yellow Submarine song track. I thought the remixing was wonderful. I still believe it is. I'm a big uh, proponent of the remixing, similar to what Giles Martin did with the Sgt. Pepper release recently and what was done with the uh, one album a couple of years back. Uh, I really believe in this remixing idea. I'm a big fan of it. I'm a big supporter of it and I will never ever be uh, critical of future remixings of the Beatles catalog. I think it should be done. I think that they should do all the albums the way they did the Sgt. Pepper remixing recently and I'm really hoping and praying they do. So when this came out in 1999, late, uh, fall of 1999, made number 15 on the charts, I loved it. I just thought it was a fantastic release. The sound quality is great, and I'm really looking forward to getting the vinyl of this. I really can't wait to hear these, these remixings on, on vinyl now that I'm back into the vinyl scene again. So someday I will get the vinyl of this album. But in the meantime, I have the CD, and I have to say, folks, I love it. This is a great, great release by the Beatles. And I'd um, like to hear what you all think about it and some of these other releases, but especially this one. Uh, with the, This was kind of like the first remixing of Beatles material. So I'd kind of like to get your take on what you think of it. I loved it at the time, and I still do. I think it's wonderful. Okay, so that's it. Yellow Submarine song track. It was the last official Beatles release in the 1990s. Now, I'm probably not going to go into the 2000s and up to today, folks, only because, you know, you know, you know all those releases. A year after the Beatles, Yellow Submarine song track came out, you know what happened. Everything exploded at that point. Uh, the one album, the Beatles one album, came out in 2000, and that thing was a monster. It, it exploded. It's, it's gone diamond in the United States. It's like well over 10 million or 11 million plus copies sold just here in America, all over the world, millions of copies sold. It's, I think it was listed as the number one album of the, the, the first 10 years of the 2000s, number one, uh, best album ever, you know, selling wise. And, uh, and from there we've just gone beyond and had so many wonderful releases since, leading up to the most recent Sgt. Pepper. So uh, I just wanted to go back to some of those decades in the last century, the last three decades of the 20th century and talk a little bit about them and show you some of the releases, the official releases from those decades and I hope you enjoyed it. Again, just have a little fun and uh, wanted to just complete my little trilogy here because uh, I appreciated all the support with the 80s video I made and people enjoying that one. So I thought let me do a quick 70s one and a quick 90s one and just they'll all be together on my, uh, on my YouTube channel. All right, that's it, folks. I hope you had a little fun today watching this. Bring back some memories for you. God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.